welcome to our LA County Library virtual event, uh, Creative, Career, Creative Career Path. I'm Caroline Chang, Arts Program Manager at LA County Library, and I will be your host today. Uh, this program is a part of a series exploring careers in entertainment, film, TV, and the media industries. And today, director and producer Kimberly Browning will have a conversation with film editors Pai Ware and Luyan Vu. So I'm going to start off by introducing our presenters today. But while I am doing that, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So please say hello to us in the chat and share with us what you're hoping to get out of the conversation today or where you are in your career journey. So first of all, I would like to introduce Kimberly Browning, who will be moderating and facilitating our conversation. Uh, Kimberly is a filmmaker based in LA and is the founder and festival director of the Hollywood Shorts Film Festival, which launched in 1998. She is an associate short film programmer at Tribeca Film Festival and a senior programmer at Catalyst Content Festival. She has been the executive producer of HBO Access since 2015 and is now part of the new Warner Media Access Programs team, developing emerging writers and directors in episodic television. Uh, we also have Pai Ware with us today. Uh, he is an Emmy-winning editor and director who works across genres from scripted features to documentaries to concerts and competitions. His films have appeared at Sundance and 75 other film festivals. He has edited content for every major network in the U.S. and is a member of the America Cinema Editors. Uh, the most recent film Pai directed is Skin Deep, The Battle Over Mar Margellans. I'm saying that right, I apologize. Other CV highlights include America's Got Talent, Fastest Car, American Idol, and Dave Chappelle, the Kennedy Center, Mark Twain Prize, for which he received a 2020 Emmy nomination. Uh, we also have Luyan Lu Vu, uh, who is an American film editor with us today. He began his love of film while studying philosophy as an undergraduate at UCLA, uh, subsequently attending the prestigious USC School Cinematic Arts graduate program. He started his career out as an assistant editor on Emmy nominated shows such as Arrested Development and Heroes, but quickly was promote, promoted to editor on the acclaimed J.J. Abrams series Fringe. Uh, Lou believes in giving back to the editing community, having served on the executive committee of the Academy of Television, as well as the Asian American Steering Committee for the Editors Guild. And he is also an active member of the American Cinema Editors. And so with that, I will hand it over to Kimberly to start us off. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Really excited to um, get to spend some time with Pi and Lou, and would love to kind of start at the beginning. So um, a lot of people joining us today are thinking about beginning a career in editing, have been editing their own pieces, maybe doing YouTube videos or TikToks, things with using the tools that their computers have. So how did you take the next step in creating a career for yourself in, um, in exploring the editorial arts. Lou, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, um, uh, I guess I more or less got started in editing when, uh, when I was in film school, it was just something that I was, uh, sort of spent a lot of time and enjoyed doing. And so from there, um, shortly after graduation, I was more or less broken couldn't find work. And a friend of mine basically was like, you're pretty good with computers. Why don't you come over here and work for us? And, uh, it was at a, a reality TV house that made, um, uh, basically home improvement shows. And so from there met a few people and then, uh, was able to get to, um, working at MTV for a little bit. And then, uh, from there, yet another friend called me and said, uh, you should move over to narratives. And she basically told me all of the steps to basically get into the union. And from there, um, I was able to get into onto uh, Arrested Development, which was my first uh, show as an assistant. Um, I assisted for about a few years and then I got promoted uh, over when I was over at uh, a TV show called Fringe and then I've uh, been editing since, so. Amazing. And Pai, what about you? What were your first yeses? Well, I started, I came to Los Angeles with the dream of being a, an independent filmmaker in the 90s, like a lot of folks. And um, when you're a low budget or no budget independent filmmaker, you have to do a lot of the jobs that others would do. And so one of the jobs that I had to do was was editing. I was really interested in writing and directing and kind of making my own vision happen. But as I started to learn the editing process, just out of necessity, um, it, I started to get decent at it. Um, 
And also I needed to pay rent. And so I would do like vacuum cleaner commercials. I would cut um, editor reels, not editor reels. I would cut um, actor reels or director of photography reels, just sample pieces for other people so that they could show um, what they've done. And so I started then doing tributes to um, celebrities uh, be at, at film festivals, just editing together like their highlights. So doing a lot of like, sort of like highlight reels of different types. And this was just me figuring out Final Cut Pro with a book that I got um, and it had some sample footage on it. And then um, I had a short film at AFI Film Festival that was playing there. And there was a filmmaker who I had worked for as a PA in Madrid, like years before his name is Pedro Almodovar. And the film festival organizers knew that I had worked for him and knew that I was learning how to edit. And they said, well, I tell you what, if you edit this tribute to Pedro Amadovar for us for free, we will let you learn this other machine called the Avid, this other software. And you can use our our, um, our facilities to learn this and you, you're the payment that you would give us would be this cool tribute. And it worked out really well. And I learned more and more um, about editing through through AFI, although I wasn't actually a student there. I was actually um, kind of a co-worker of types. Anyway, that's that's how I started learning how to edit and how I started getting into um, tributes. And then that led to like film history, like behind the scenes um, documentaries, little short documentaries. I went on the DVDs that were being released uh, in, the, in the early aughts. Uh, and that's, that's how I kind of came through uh, the editing process and, and just kept doing more and more of these kind of celebrity focused or history focused um special feature documentaries that were big back in the day i mean the people they, they would say well we have a theatrical release so we can get to the dvd release because it made a lot of money and then they were very into these special features and then one day literally within two weeks that entire industry just sort of died it crumbled down and went like 95 percent loss of what they were doing and um when dvds kind of nosedived and so i was pivoting to different types of award shows um, and things that were that were around me at the time. So one of the things I've noticed uh, through the years is the rapid ascent and the evolution of kind of how important technology and computers have been to editorial. When I started at film school, we were still cutting on steam decks and cutting film. And through, I think our first Media 100 was like my freshman year of film school. So <clears throat> can you talk about how much self-education there is? You both have kind of mentioned how you taught yourself. Um, and I think there's a conversation to be had today about the creative art of editing and storytelling. But I think um, what's going to be really encouraging to a lot of our audience is how people who are really um, strong at learning computer software, that there are a lot of jobs in the editorial that are um you can enter if you feel like you're strong and be able to learn the software then you can learn the artistic approach through that process can you guys um lou can you talk a little bit about how did you keep up with the software <laughs> what do you find yourself <laughs> editing on most now yeah did the software impact your learning curve in terms of storytelling talk yeah. to us about your relationship with your computer <laughs> okay well um uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I've always sort of been interested in technology, and so um, I just sort of it, enjoyed doing that a lot. But uh, like you, I was actually cutting on, um, uh, well, uh, movieolas and steambacks when we were uh, in film school. And then right when I was in film school, that's when we started getting in some software. But like you had to buy, like, I mean, the rigs were, you know, anywhere from like 2000 to $5,000 just to just to do like the tiniest bit of editing. Uh, but uh, in in school, I had learned Premiere Pro, and that wasn't really um, uh, at the time. It was really elementary. It, it, I mean, I, at this point, iMovie would be better than the version yeah. of Premiere Pro I, I used back then. Premiere Pro was like iMovie back in the day. That's a good analogy. Yeah, and so um, I um, Final Cut Pro was just coming out when I was in film school, and so we people were starting to play with it because it was just sort of this new world of oh, this is um, uh, sort of democratizing the ability to to work on um, editing 
Um, and so I learned a little bit of that. I actually ended up teaching a little bit of that um, uh, at a job when I came out of film school. Um, but um, much like Pi, I, I knew that Avid was going to be something important to learn. And I actually didn't learn it at all in film school, even though we had it in film school. Um, and, um, you know, when you talk about like, what are your yeses or what do you say yes to? I took a job at MTV and, and they, they said, did you know Avid? And I said, yes, I did not. <laughs> and literally, <laughs> I, had people, I had somebody over, like, I was like, ah, it's, it looks like Final Cut Pro. I could probably figure it out. How much different could it be? How different could it be? And like, lucky for me, I mean, I was like toying around with it, you know, in my off hours trying to figure it out. Um, uh, you know, back then there wasn't any sort of like YouTube tutorials or anything like that. I couldn't learn it that way. So it was just a lot of playing around. And then luckily for me, um, a, a friend, well, not a coworker, I just kept on asking her questions. She's like, hey, where, what's your knowledge level? And I'm like, honestly, nothing. So what can you teach me? And she taught me everything. And so um, she taught so me how to- you found a great mentor, somebody that would take you under their wing and- Yeah, That's it's weird. I, I wouldn't even say it's a mentor it, because we were, um, we were similar in age and this is the nature of okay. I think working the business which is that um she was teaching me that and then like a year later uh, I was I was putting her up for jobs in narrative and then yeah. so and like we've kind of traded back and forth over the past two decades of like working together and so yeah. um you know she's mentioned me for certain things I've mentioned her for certain things it's great um but yeah she taught me the basics and and honestly I think I often, very often get the question, I'm sure all uh, Pi does too, which is like, what software should I learn? And in general, at least for my work, I believe uh, it's you, it doesn't matter what hammer you're using, it's you need to learn how to build a house. So like, if you learn Final Cut Pro, you learn Premiere Pro, or you learn Avid, either way, the more important part is to learn how to build the house. Um, and and the, and using learning how to use the hammer efficiently, quote unquote, the, the software is important, but it's not. Um, you, you'll learn it piece by piece as you go around, and once you kind of get the general idea, they are all roughly uh, similar. And so I think it's pretty interesting. But I, I will say uh, back to the technology thing. I'd say it, it it amazes me that I, I used to have to, you know, there used to be this huge average like eighty or ninety thousand dollar machine, and now I can go buy a laptop for like less than a thousand dollars and do everything I did back then and then some <laughs> and and you could do it at a coffee shop which I know Pi you do right you, you actually go edit at a coffee shop sometimes yeah I have before I was editing a, a one of my documentaries at a coffee shop and just yeah. added like an extra screen that you could put up on a little stand so I have a two screen editing system uh that fits inside a backpack it's amazing yeah. it's amazing how, how small it can get it's almost like you know like learning how to edit is important but it it's not it's no longer you're, you're no longer prohibited from learning it by money. So it's like writing, right? Everyone can afford a piece of paper and a pencil or everyone can afford an under sub $1,000 laptop where you just type and, and you have to learn the skills. You, like Lou says, you have to learn how to, how to build a house. Um, if, you, if you are actually going, well, what should I learn? I, I am gonna learn something, what's the best thing? I would say if you wanna go into assistant editing in a, in a professional, like union way, learn the Avid. If you are into more independent film and documentaries, learn Adobe Premiere. I myself do both. Um, I do the Avid mostly because I'm on a lot of network television shows, but I constantly go back to, to Premiere. I just did uh, like a, a sample reel on Premiere just so I can keep up with it, even though I don't use it that often. Uh, I think it's important to, to keep up with this this technology. And there's there's a lot of ways that you can can learn this stuff, which kind of, it's, it's interesting if, if people are wondering, like, should I go to film school? You know, do I need to go to film school? Do I need to take these classes? What, what exactly do I need? And I would say the same thing that uh, Richard Linklater said in the 1990s, he's one of the, the um, independent filmmaking pioneers. He said, you don't have to go to film school, but you have to learn what people are taught in film school. And you do that generally through making films with other people. So you need a group you need, it could be friends or it could be, you know, I was involved with Filmmakers Alliance as Kimberly Browning was uh, in the 90s. And and we were a collective of people who made films and, and just worked. I would be your sound mixer on one, um, on, on your on your short movie. And then you would come and be my gaffer on my next, on my short film. And and that's what you do in film schools. You, you learn all the different jobs so that you can have a wide perspective of how filmmaking works. And 
that really can help inform you as an editor. You can have empathy and understanding for the process and why this camera shot is blown and you're looking at it and you're like, what are these guys, idiots? No, I mean, it's difficult and there's a lot of challenges and you learn that through um, making films with groups of people. So I would say you, you don't have to go to film school. I mean, definitely it's Great. not like, I work with people and, you know, Lou went to an esteemed film school, amazing, two of them, amazing film schools. <laughs> um, I've worked with people who graduated from NYU and they work side by side with people who never even went to college. And this, it's, you can't tell the difference in their editing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, the joke I used to always make was uh, I was collecting useless degrees, <laughs> but uh, I will say, I think similar to what you're saying, Pi, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of value in getting a group, a, a friend group of filmmakers, uh, because you do learn a lot and, and you do kind of get that a lot with, um, what, you know, the more you work, you'll build that up, but as you're trying to make your way in, I think it's very important to have that, that, that sort of uh, group of people that you can learn from. So. And and like, you know, Lou experienced, he had someone who could help him with the Avid, um, which is really important because these pieces, whether it's Premiere um, or the Avid, um, it's important to have people who can help you. Now, Premiere has a great system of just YouTube tutorials. Like, you can pretty much, like, I don't really call people for help on Premiere, even though I need help on Premiere from time to time. I just go to YouTube. It's all there. Yeah. Avid's a little different because it's a little more insider uh, of, a, of a piece of software. And I had to have a, like a friend of mine who really knew a lot more than I did. And I would call and be like, why isn't this working the way it's supposed to work? The submaster effect, use that yeah. and it'll collapse. <laughs> right. You know, he would just walk me through at my panic at a job while the producer's out of the room, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, you do have to it's kind of stay <laughs> cool and keep, <laughs> keep your wits about you as you're, taking jobs and doing things that are just a little beyond your actual capabilities and be very willing to learn and open to putting in extra hours like Lou did, you know, and, and, and learning this stuff. Um, because you want to prove your worth as a worker if you want the job. You just yeah. have to have value. And so how do you get it? Well, education and practice and experience. And now if you're going to go assist in editing, you want to definitely really learn the software like really well because a lot of especially in in the nonfiction world a lot of editors won't be that interested in the technical stuff and if you don't get the technical stuff right when you ingest all the footage into the system very bad things can happen yeah. um, and you will be blamed and, and <laughs> well, let's which, talk is, about, which is which let's is actually a story it. oh sorry go ahead yeah go ahead lou and then uh, we're oh i was talking just talking about our crews and how we build or editing yeah. team and the different jobs within the pipeline. Okay. Um, I, I was just going to jump on what Pi said there at the end. I was, uh, I was an assistant editor over at MTV and I literally had 12 editors and I was the only assistant. And oh my God, did you <laughs> and, drink and, at night? And I, and well, it was, I worked at night. That was the weirdest part oh. about it. And this is the nature of it. This was the nature of it back then. Cause the, the, the avids were so expensive. There was twelve editors. Were you on they, one of the, the Real World? Are you were you on the I competition was, shows? Yes, so was I was on. I was on seven. making the. Yeah, I was making the band, and uh, I think yeah. we had seventeen hundred hours of footage, or something like that. I mean, it's ridiculous. But the uh, you know, and we had to ingest it back then, as opposed to just copying it over. But um, I had twelve editors, and I was the only assistant. So um, it and luckily we were in this huge facility in Santa Monica, and there was there were like three or four other shows, but. If there was something wrong, they would own, they would all twelve of them would come to me, and I would have to figure it out. You, you knew where all the bones were buried. Cause... Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, luckily again, I think you know, the community is very important. There, there were other editors on other sh assistant editors on other shows. I would go and ask, but uh, it's not uncommon. I think uh, Pi, well, you, you tell me the nowadays it, it, you don't have a one to one ratio in in reality TV, right? It's it's typically a, a fairly low number of assistants comparatively to the the number of editors definitely not one to one yeah three to 14 or something wow yeah i mean when you're working on like american idol the amount of cameras on a show like that and keeping that all organized it must be insane for your your assistant staff yeah there's there's um there's a there's like night assistants that come in and then they sort through so if you know if you're on a show like american idol um where there's a lot of um, P 
people who come and, and audition, like so many people, so much footage, and it has to get organized in some way. So there's a team of people who are sorting. So these assistant editors come in at night and they just watch all the stuff and they sort it into different types of organizational things that you'll need. Um, that's a whole team. And then in the daytime, there's uh, assistant editors who are, are, are working diligently, you know, two to three, sometimes four, if it's a big, big show, um, editors working uh, to organize things and to ingest footage. Um, there's a there's a decent labor pool there, you know, and there's I think it's a good way in um, nonfiction um, assistant editing. There's 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 opportunity there um, if you if you want to take the initiative and learn the software yeah. and, and and apply for jobs. That could be a good way in. Yeah, and I also think um, you tell me, Pi. I I learned so much working in nonfiction because it was just problem solving all day long as an assistant, like. It was just like one thing would go wrong over here. There's because there's just so much media and so much stuff. Um, I've learned I learned all of my troubleshooting skills. I think from those from those years working in in uh, nonfiction. So, it's yeah. A great place. yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great place. There's there's opportunity for people who are reliable and who do take the job as like, I mean, you, you know, family's like priority one, but like priority two is like job. You know, and people who show up and are reliable and and who who you know are honest and open and 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 keep in communication like most problems on earth are due to bad communication or miscommunication and so if you really have some skills um where you're connecting with people and you learn how to communicate well and you've got the knowledge of the software and the systems that are, are being uh, used then what what a valuable person you are to to have on staff um i actually had a question for you pi the um uh, I've been having a really hard time finding assistance in the past couple of years. There's just been so much work. Is that also true in in on your side of the business? Well, uh, you know, I'm not doing as much narrative uh, nowadays, so uh, I haven't really done a lot of hiring of assistant editors. Um, the place that I, I actually I did have to find somebody recently. Yeah. Um, for a uh, it's like a little documentary so one of the things that, yeah. that we do is that we, hey we're going to do a documentary you want to do a documentary series and sell it to netflix so you know we go and we shoot a bunch of a sample stuff like a little trailer just a little piece of it and we do a proof of concept for what's called the sizzle reel where you make a kind of trailer for your show and um i needed an assistant and so the question was how do where do i go how do i get one how do i get a reliable one um and i went to facebook because there's a group called uh, Blue Collar Post Collective, um, which, you know, if you're watching this and you're interested in getting into the, the industry and assistant editing, that's a great resource, Blue Collar Post Collective on Facebook. And I posted, hey, we're looking for an assistant editor. It's not a great paying job, but I got a lot of people um, who were qualified who sent me resumes. And uh, the person I ended up hiring was actually somebody I knew uh, from before who had volunteered as an apprentice and as an assistant and like graphics, he eventually became a graphics designer on my, um, documentary that I made. I did an independent documentary that was, um, you know, funded through, uh, Kickstarter and like through donations. So it was all kind of volunteer ish or, or very low paying in, in, in certain regards. And I had met this guy who had through the same, through the same thing, through, through that blue collar post collective. Um, and he volunteered, I would buy him lunch and he would volunteer on my documentary um, as an assistant and then as somebody making like graphics. Um, and then and, and, was, and about that was what, about four or five years ago that you made mm -hmm. that talk, right? Yeah, he was so in that time. He had grown in her or his editorial storytelling skills where he he made a great AE for you, like what? Had he been able to do no, graphics he, that you were like, oh, I know this guy, I can hire him. You know, he is, he hadn't gone into assistant editing. Um, he wasn't that strong of an assistant editor. Um, he was doing graphics um, for like a brand, right? But he was kind of growing tired of that. And so he saw my little Facebook post and he said, oh, well, you know, I'm interested in doing this. I want to get back into assistant editing. And I was like, well, how well do you know Premiere? He's like, eh. And it's like, well, okay. <laughs> Are you willing to learn what you need to do to make this a professional job and get it done? You gave him an said, opportunity. Yeah, he said, yeah. 
And I said, because I know you, you know, he learned how to make the graphics originally. Like he wasn't that, yeah. he didn't know that much, but he learned on the job. And that was, that was somebody I knew he could learn, you know, learn it and be serious about it and deliver stuff and, and, and hear criticism, constructive criticism. Hey, we need to kind of take it up a level here, 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 and here. And I knew that as a personality type, he was reliable and he was willing to learn. And those two things are essential more yeah. than knowing how to use the red filter that takes 360 <laughs> degree footage that's on a from a GoPro on the bottom of yeah. the plane and apply it. More important than that knowledge is the willingness to learn that knowledge and teach it to me and show yeah. me how it works in Premiere, you know, yeah. because then we're all educated and, and I can trust this person. But yeah. I think that that's a really good note that relationships um, and the collegiality is so important and a lot of opportunities um, yeah. are going to come from the people. There was a confidence you had because you knew the person, you knew their personality. There was a baseline and you hired somebody that had less experience because there was a known factor and how much that that actually translates into opportunity. You don't have to be the guy in, or the girl in the room that knows the most or has the most experience. Many times you could create opportunity because you're you're working together with people you know. Or uh, yeah, yeah, That's, and Lou, absolutely. And what I think do you the look for when you're looking to hire your team. Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, I think Pi is sort of hitting it right there, which is I think. Uh, often it's times it's somebody I know or I'm familiar with. That's that's probably the, the the biggest thing, but that's not all. Obviously, always the case. Um, recently, uh, like I said, we, we there's uh, we've been having a shortage in assistant editors um, in narrative. Specifically, so, in our you work a lot in our drama. Yeah. At yeah. Network and at cable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I'm doing an Apple TV show right now, and we had the hardest time finding good assistance and so um what does that mean you had a like did they need to be living in a certain place was there a certain skill set you were looking for you know, was there a certain I, I, yeah i think i think that's sort of the point of where I'm, I'm headed which is that like we you know obviously we were sort of like we were a fairly big show we wanted that somebody with experience but uh you know that didn't work out. We couldn't find anybody with any experience that was available. There's, there's just been such a great shortage. I, I think the point I'm saying with that was that there, there's actually a lot of opportunity out there right now because there's so much content being made. But uh, yeah, we were, we couldn't find anybody, and we ended up finding a person who had almost no experience. Um, but we liked his attitude a lot. He was, uh, you know, he was, and he'd been great. He's been with us for the past uh, four months. He's our VFX assistant, and he's been. Um, he basically knew a little bit of the avid and he did sort of spend a bunch of weeks on his own, like going through lynda.com or whatever, or YouTube, just trying to learn avid. And, um, he's been a great assistant editor. So yeah, I, I think to Pi's point is that like your attitude is almost is, is actually way more important than your skill set because, uh, if you have the right attitude, you'll learn the skills. Mm -hmm. So, and so. Um, to our audience, after this seminar, Caroline's going to put together a whole deck with all these different links that we're discussing and the resources that we're talking about. Um, and there will be links there where we'll send you to some sites where you can see all the different jobs that are in a workflow and kind of some of the first jobs that you should keep your eye out for that are good entry level jobs. Um, so I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about what the structure of your team, I think people see the editor and they win the award at the Emmys and they're on screen at the Oscars winning the best editor awards. Um, and there's so many really robust career level jobs that are not necessarily the editor all the way through post. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you do so much competition show. You may work on American Art. You you cut the biggest shows, and so I imagine there are, are a lot of people. In the, are you at a post shop? Are you at a facility that the show has hired? And how many people are working there? Give us a sense of the how many opportunities there are, and what are the different job positions? And that's a it works a little bit differently than narrative. And so I'd like you guys to kind of. Break it down when you're building your team. Who's there? What do you need? 
So there's sort of two parts, I guess, for uh, for these like America's Got Talent competition shows. Um, one, there's like a, a post house, which we so a post production facility called the post house. It's just a big building. It's a business that has a lot of computers in it that where they have all these avids or I guess it could be premiere. There was one back in the day. Um, editing that was, suite. That was for Final Cut Pro, which was very exciting. Back What's in that? <laughs> yeah. well, I, was, I was gonna go even further back. We used to call it the lab. The lab. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was literally where the film was developed. Oh, absolutely. Back yeah. The so day, there's, there's, there's this place in Burbank. Yeah. <laughs> Most of these things are in Burbank, um, especially all the film that used yes. to be developed. Um, anyway, th there's a lot of opportunity there. I mean, you've got receptionist, right? You've got some. You got to handle the phones. You've got to, you know, clean the the place after it closes. You've got um, so post production assistant, your PA, post PA. Like, there's a great entry level position where you're stocking the fridge, you're getting, you're running errands, you're helping editors get their lunch. You're just doing like basic stuff. Um, and you're ingratiating yourself to this team, right? So that's you're building relationships and you're doing an entry level job. Then there's um, a post production supervisor who kind of supervises um, the whole post production, all the editors and budget, and 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 he has a coordinator, which is not entry level, but that's a step up. If you show yourself as a good PA, you can go there. And then if you get really great, then you're a post supervisor. Um, then there's the assistant editors. So like I'd mentioned earlier, there's people who can sort through. Who just have a you know decent knowledge of Avid, but not an extensive knowledge of Avid, and they just organize footage, watch footage, and organize it. It's kind of like the old data entry jobs, but more interesting, for sure. Um, those are great jobs that you can have just with a little bit of experience. Um, and then beyond that, you know, it's making the jump from assistant editor to to editor. Um, plus, there's lots of producing jobs as well that that focus around, um, you know, on set production yeah i mean i when, when i first got my first job in rea in reality tv was actually being a assistant story producer which was just sort of building string outs in the avid and so um yeah there's there, there's a lot of different ways to get in and in fact i mean i think you bring up an interesting point pi i have, I have a friend who um uh she was uh she worked at facility she was uh she had worked her way i think up from like being the receptionist to uh, doing some online stuff. And she was sort of in the chair, but she really wanted to get into narrative. And um, over the years, she finally made her way over to narratives and she was assisting me on a pilot uh, recently. And then she did such a great job that we actually, I actually gave her a shared credit. And now she's an editor on that series. And so- That's incredible. Uh, that gets yeah, there's, yeah, there, for the union. Yeah, there's a lot of different paths. And I mean, probably the easiest path I can point out, which is generally what I, have pointed out to people, um, and, and this we'll talk about, you, uh, Kimberly, your question about the team. Um, I had a PA uh, with me on Fringe who then, he wanted to become an assistant editor, and so he would hang out with us after he was done with his PA work. And so um, me and the other three, me and the other two editors, we would just teach him a little bit here and there. And he, um, we told him, go, go get your non-union hours so that you can get a union. He did that for a couple of years, and he just kept in touch with me, and then, um, I hired him as an assistant editor, uh, on a show that I, I needed somebody and, you know, we worked together for a few years and now he's an editor. He's actually an editor on the series I'm on now. And so, um, but I, it kind of all goes back to that. Like the relationships are the most important and, and keeping those up, but, um, there are a lot of different paths, but yeah, I would say the entry level stuff anywhere from the PA to, um, you know, I, I've had people that were the assistant over in the um, on production or the writer side, they wanted to hang out with us and they just kept in touch with us and we eventually helped them get into yeah. editorial. So I remember, you know, music was my first art language. So I grew up as a musician and I came to LA as a professional working musician and then was able to get into film school from there. And back then they never considered that women women were not encouraged to be on director path but because i was a musician i was always told oh work in post you're going to be a great editor because you have a sense of rhythm that's a um a key ingredient that um that's a great lane for you to get into 
And so when I was in film school, I would make my money at night syncing sound for everybody's dailies. And that's how I started because the audio was easy for me to match things up when I was fast. Um, and so that job has evolved into um, a different kind of job now, but I still think, I still think people who understand pacing and the rhythm of how we talk and being able to understand a character and understand the differences between characters in a scene uh, is, is a skill set that could say, hey, if I'm good at that, post could be a space for me. What other character, I think being patient's really important. Things change all the time. Directors change all the time. Not getting married to how you cut it. Some, you know, what are the characteristics that you think somebody, when they're looking at themselves and what they might adapt well to, what do you like to see that make a strong editor? Kind of personal characteristics. Um. I, uh, you know, it's funny, it's interesting, um, also because since, uh, you know, a lot of the audience is sort of on their way, and I would say the, probably the one of the most important skills for an assistant editor is organizing, <laughs> just being organized. It's like, it's such a huge thing, and and I, I know a lot of people are very interested in the creative stuff, which is great, but like, if you want to be an assistant editor, you got to at least understand the organizational part of it. Um, but in terms of the creative stuff of being an editor, um, I don't know, I, 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 you probably, I guess you would probably feel the same way, which is that like, I mean, when I got out of film school, I spent a lot of time writing, uh, kind of like you were, you were sort of starting out as a writer director. And like all those, all that time spent thinking about story and how it comes together and, and understanding those aspects have served me the most in terms of my work as an editor. Uh, it's, it's that basic, basic storytelling um, parts that are important. And then, yeah, I think probably one of the other things is and you learn this again once you have a group of people you work with is that like you learn how powerful collaboration is and i think those things are those are huge those are probably the biggest things to me um yeah i, I totally agree Lou. like uh storytelling like beginning middle end the, just just having those three words in your head all the time will help you in every aspect of this business and you do to, to be a good editor Eventually you get to a spot where you can be objective and subjective at the same time, which just takes experience because as, as a, and, and, and so to get there, you just need to keep creating things. They can be stupid little YouTube videos that no one sees. You don't even have to post them, just keep them unlisted, whatever. You need to keep creating things and storytelling and, and not just ways of that you're hired to do every day in and out, but also you are doing with your friends or just yourself just to, to keep engaged, whether it's writing, whether it's shooting, um, whether it's just taking other people's footage and putting it together, but, but for your own storytelling purposes, I think those kinds of small exercises are really important so that you have your own engine running, right? Storytelling engine running, and you can take initiative. So when you're hired to do something, you have another perspective. You're not just like, what do you want me to do? Okay, I'll do it. It's right. I'm a storyteller. We're collaborating. You want me to do this? Okay. I'll start doing it. Oh, you know what? I feel like this needs to go in this direction. And, and you have some kind of agency in the storytelling and opinions that, you know, can help guide uh, where this storytelling goes because invariably the director or the producer you're working with is going to have not thought the whole thing through because no one can. You just come up upon blind corners within uh, an episode um, that you, no one really thought about and you have to go into problem solving. And that's, that's what's great about the the editing is there's all these creative story puzzles you're doing all the time and it, it keeps your mind engaged um if you approach it with the right attitude if you're just a eh, pushing buttons doing what i'm told mm, it can be very tedious because the hours are long but if you learn about storytelling and you know read the basics the classics um of, of screenwriting, you know, you should, you should look into that because that's crafting stories in our, in our, in our, um, in our world. Um, learn, learn that and learn the basics of storytelling. And, um, and like, like Lou says, I mean, collaboration is, is huge. And, and so to, to speak to that, like, how do I learn how to collaborate? Well, I would say you want to meet people in, and, and you, that you can have long-term relationships with. Like, you don't want to be like, 
meeting people and trying to be the person you think they want you to be, because that's going to break down eventually. And they'll see that you've just been faking it and that you don't really get along with them that well. You want to find people. Um, you always want to be polite and you always want to, you know, put your best foot forward and really present yourself well. But at the same time, you want to find people that you can be authentic with uh, for long periods of time, spending a lot of time in the same room. And so that it's a natural working environment for you that, yeah. that you can you can find people that you can recommend and feel trust, you know, and feel confident in, in recommending them and, and vice versa. Like if if, you know, they, they can learn to trust you, then they can recommend you. And, you know, I've known Kimberly since the, the late 90s. We've worked together. You know what I mean? Like it's worked together. Yeah, we, we I think about pie. Pi come to my mind any job I'm and and Lou as well. I get to work with him on a lot of um uh, with more things even coming up that we're going to get to collaborate on. I think um one of the great things this is the best time ever to begin a journey into this into this part of of art form because yeah. the accessibility is there. I find a people are gathering and finding groups to collab with and play with and create with. Um, you don't have to go to film school to find your group of people. The great news is on the film festival side, there are gatherings and screenings and festivals on every corner of the planet, no matter where you live. There's something going on at the libraries where you live are always how hosting screenings. If you are in Southern California, um, there's a festival at everywhere, bars, churches. And during this time of COVID, so many of these festivals are um, offering um, virtual accessibility to the films that they've programmed. Slamdance offered all of their programming up for $10. Start watching the short films, watch the music video. This year at Tribeca, we're gonna have a music video um, competition. We've never done that before. We have a lot of AR and VR, which I think is a really interesting yeah. world um, for post because it's breaking boundaries. There's so, there's so much demand for people of color, for women to come in as editing and storytellers. Um, there's just so many opportunity, even in games that people don't yeah. think about and the editorial needs there that translate really well into games. Um, and it's the kind of the same workflow. If you have any kind of basic AE understanding of how it flows, Warner Brothers games is always looking and the VX world, VFX are always in search of really good editors and assistant editors. Um, and so I get excited when I see, well, it used to be on Facebook, the Facebook users group was such a collegiate, helpful, warm group. And you would see them pair off. A lot of these things maybe aren't hosted on Facebook's still there. I think some of the younger people are coming together in different ways on different platforms but they're findable and they don't necessarily have to be in your town to be able to collaborate, to share footage. There is a group that started during COVID through Tina Imahara and she had people, I think in 12 different countries and these different, and they got together and they remotely made a short film together over the course of the first year of the pandemic. And they just found each other on Facebook where yeah. Tina just opened it up and people referred to each other and they just started writing together. They started collaborating they decided to shoot. Um, and I, you know, I come from this, the, I come from the church of, if I don't see it, I start it. That's how Hollywood shorts started. Right. I just started what I needed in my creative group to make my own group. And there's no better time to do that. We have all the resources online and it costs you nothing. So wherever you're going to high school, if you are going to local college, if you are not, find the people that are making the films that blow your mind. Find the people whose short films and first features are being screened at local festivals and reach out to them on social media and say, I love the way you tell story. 
Look at who that editor was. IMDB lists all of us that are working in all the shows we work on. So find a couple of films that you really love, the way that they told story, really touched your heart. Or what are you watching on cable? What are you watching um, that you'll stay up and binge it? Look and start to get to know the names of the people in those editorial teams. Because if you find some of them on Twitter or on Instagram, hit them up and you can start to create your own um, spark plugging your your relationships that can create opportunities for you. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about what you watched when you were learning what your style of editing was, what storytelling was to you. I think most editors tell me they learned by what they watch and they were influenced in their editorial style by the type of editing they saw. I'm a huge Thelma Schoolmaker fan. She's kind of my spirit animal. <laughs> and when I first was starting out and I wanted to be her, I thought she was Scorsese's editor and it was a woman, right? Um, and when I was young, so can you tell us a little bit about what what you sought out to watch and, and what editors or processes really turned you on and got you figuring out your ABCs? Um, yeah, I think for me, it was, um, I mean, you know, I grew up watching Spielberg movies, you know, day in, day out, and uh, just spent a lot of time looking at that. I think that's pr probably even goes back a couple of topics ago, which is like one of the other skills I think is really important is being able to be uh, a good uh, analyzer of stuff. So I'd watch these, you know, Spielberg movies over and over and being like, wait, how, how is he making it make me feel this way? And so you can kind of sort of break down, you're like, oh, well, he did this thing, or he pushes in on this person at this moment, or the music swells at this point. And those those are, you know, analysis, that stuff, yeah, you could do on your own, you could do at home with, you know, just you and a TV, just kind of just rewind, which, you know, again, back in the day, we, we didn't have access to that. And, 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 and you're right, Kimberly, the, the world that we're in now is, it has sort of opened up more opportunities for this type of work than anywhere in history. I mean, the fact that you could edit and shoot an entire thing on something like this <laughs> is is amazing. Um, and you know, I I'll, I'll watch some YouTube channels where they this uh, you know some guys will literally shoot themselves as they're talking to another person. It's just them on the other piece of coverage, and they'll just they'll shoot it. So like, there's a lot of availability for uh, for those types of opportunities. But uh, back to your yeah influences. I mean, to me, I love Spielberg. Kind of grew up in that era of Star Wars and Spielberg movies, and uh, those always influenced me. But as I got older, uh, especially with editorial stuff, I think um, Terrence Malick and, and his stuff have been the most influential to me because it's he uh, as as a uh, writer director I work with, he, he always says uh, to use the full language of cinema. And, and I always felt like Terrence Malick did that. And it was it was always a that that I've always watched his stuff, and then there's always something new I'm sort of discovering in terms of like what he's going for and what he's trying. And so um, that would be my short answer. But I mean, I, I watch a movie every night almost. I'll watch anywhere from 200, 300 movies a year just because I love it, first off. But it's also like I feel like this is all part of the art of, of doing what we do. You got to sort of kind of keep learning. And uh, yeah. the best way to learn is just to watch, uh, to watch other people and be like, oh, wow, that's not something I would have done, but that's very interesting. And like, yeah. could, could I, could I bring that into something I'm working on now? So. Mm -hmm. What about you, Pi? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, my influence, I, I love Terrence Malick. I love Spielberg. I love Scorsese. Um, as far as editors, I love Walter Murch. Um, I love the editing from JFK that Oliver Stone film was fantastic and groundbreaking. But important to the people watching this is, well, who do you like? What films do you like? And and then I, I there's a couple of things that are happening that are really exciting. One, people are remaking scenes, reshooting scenes on their own and putting them up on YouTube. That exercise is very important. It's the same exercise that, that I kind of did. I went to film school for a semester before I dropped out. I went to graduate school at Loyola Marymount University for one semester. And I, I learned a bunch and then I saw that it was that's all I really needed to learn. I just needed to go do the things that I had learned. Um, so one of the exercise, the, the most valuable exercise 
that we did in film school, which you can do right now, is to take a film that you love. For me, it was Schindler's List at the time. I really, speaking of Spielberg, like to take a scene from the film from uh, the film that you love that has a bunch of different camera angles, and to then draw out the set where everything is and where the cameras are when they shot it and what the camera moves were and understand how that was made, like really break it down because you everyone watches movies. Well, what's the difference between you and them? Well, you need to analyze, as Lou was saying, you need to analyze those movies that you're watching, not all the time, but like you need to really stop and go, okay, this I love, how, why do I love it? How did he do that scene? Where were the cameras? When did it move? When did the score come up and why? Was the score bringing tension to the moment or was it expressing the soul of the character? You know, you need to know these things. You need to know how, the, the, the molecular structure of filmmaking because you're going to be doing it. And it's not impossible to learn. I think some talents might not be for in everybody's, you know, realm. Uh, and that's why they're superstars as actors or directors or whatever it is. But the actual like nuts and bolts of filmmaking, you need to learn it because you're going to be doing it. And um, you can learn that by breaking down scenes from one of your favorite films. Uh, yeah. In fact, it, I've, I've seen uh, I've seen some very interesting things where somebody will take like a Marvel movie and they'll recut it as if some other director directed it. And I'm just like, yeah, oh, that's, that's really fun. Style. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Same thing with like, I mean, probably one of the most famous ones was somebody did the uh, the Shining trailer as if it was a rom com, and like, yeah. you know, th those are skills. Though. That, that those are deep, right. deep storytelling skills to learn. And I think yeah, that transitions as well to. Oh, go ahead, Pat. Nothing. I was just saying, and it's fun. Like, yeah, but you know, have fun. Do spoofs. Like spoofs are fun, but you're also learning you're making fun of something but you have to learn the techniques that they use to then employ them and turn them on their head and make fun of them those are oh. those are really great ways to learn the techniques yeah. yeah in fact in fact one of the things i think when i first started out uh working and just beyond just being assistant editor i would cut uh, uh the equivalent of sizzle reels but they're basically pitch reels for other people's projects so somebody's like i got this idea for uh, I don't know, like a superhero movie that takes place on Mars. And then I would, I would go and scour different movies and I'd make a trailer out of other people's footage. And uh, it was just a good story learning skill, but it's it's something that's very accessible now to do. And so I think it's a, it's a good thing to, to look at. Absolutely. That, I'm doing that literally right now. Yesterday I was, I'm making a sizzle reel and we didn't shoot anything we were yeah. gathering footage off of the internet and other movies to then create a sizzle reel and express our idea of we think this is going to be a good series and and so that skill that you as watching this can can learn and and have for free to make a, a sizzle reel um a pitch reel um will serve you throughout your career because how you know you're always going to be helping um producers create a new you know pitch a new show so yeah. learn that because it's it's free right footage is free and and you can even get um certain editing software for free you know resolve i think is is free um and that's a non yeah. yeah. um and, so and i movie awesome. comes with everything i movie make, comes make with your everything. best the make a, oh there you go yeah it comes with comes with a computer you can you can uh, i would recommend if you love movies and you want to like say what were the best films of 2021 you can make like a cool music video using those trailers and just cut them up and and play with the editing process and tell a new story recontextualize things in your uh, style in your voice in your style exactly with a really cool track that you love yeah. um i know an editor who started that way she created such a cool like version of the year before it was like 2010 or something and it was so good it got passed around and then she got hired to edit something yeah and then to her career just took off yeah um one of our um attendees uh, reminded me of a cool site called pexels p-e-x-e-l-s where people mm -hmm. just post footage and there's just raw footage up there that people can take and edit um and oh. so maybe chris you could repost that to the entire group so we could see it but um also, there's editstock.com editstock.com 
that has footage you can it, it costs I'm money but that. um it's good footage that you they it's just like raw footage from films that you can cut so you just do After the job fun. of editing um and train yourself i um want to transition to our responsibilities um as in is the editorial process is where we make our films for the third time we write them we direct them and then when you go into the edit i like to say that i come in with an open mind and that I'm remaking the film with what I have. That script I went into to production with was the blueprint that the architect created. But in the process of building, windows break. This wood got isn't holding up. We have to change midstream. So when we go into the edit, we want to try to open our mind to what's possible, to tell the story and tell the narrative and take our hero on its journey to its destination with the footage that I have. Production's over, doesn't matter what was in the script anymore. When you are collaborating, and I think it's people don't think about the importance of story in non-scripted and the work of the editor is even more critical. Uh, sometimes the editor almost becomes the co-director and sometimes in documentary because a lot, many instances what that narrative is going to emerge comes through post. You don't know what movie you have till you've shot it in documentary and things change and it's in real time. So the role of the editor is that much more critical to partner with the director and discovering what can we cut together that's going to be compelling, especially when you've got 12 people in a house, keeping it real. And so um, the people that you think were going to be the most entertaining on screen are not. And how do you craft that? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about first logistically, when you get the script or when you get the, the deck for the show, what are the questions that you're looking for? What do you want to ask the director as you start to figure out what the editorial style is going to be? How do you approach a project? How does it change for you? How much do you need to meet with the team prior to shooting? And then kind of what are your first two steps once you've sat down, your assistant has binned all the footage, the directors made their selects, you've got the script notes. So I wanna just talk about that creative process, what your responsibilities are and how do you approach the magnitude of having such responsibility for and collaborating with this person's vision? Um, Pai, do you wanna start? Um, yeah, I mean, if you were talking about documentary, Kimberly, and, and um, that, yes, the the editor can many times just become the writer. The the so a writer gives you a story and a and um, a path through this two hour movie um, or episode, um, and that's that's huge. So if you're up for that kind of job, you need to find out what the director's vision is, or if you're working on a competition show and the, there is no real director, um, you're working with individual producers, you need to find out what their vision is. The vision of the piece that you're working, what what is that? So you need to meet and find out what that is. And that can be a five minute conversation or that can be a two hour lunch um, or it can be an ongoing conversation week after week if it's some you know yeah. experimental film that, that where the vision is evolving. Um, so it's variable um, as far as like what I need to do to meet people. It's also, it depends like how collaborative they are. You know, sometimes it's just a gig where it's like, oh, hey, here, we shot this vacuum cleaner commercial. We got to cut it together. And it's like, okay, like, go. And like, that, that was the conversation. Okay, wonderful. And other times it's like somebody's really looking for you to help craft that, to have you craft the, the narrative, um, the the story of a of a of a documentary, or even if it's you know, and even narrative too. They're like, I'm really open to nonlinear telling of this to cut back and forth in time. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I guess it just depends on the project and the personalities involved, and uh, and that's why it's important to learn how to collaborate and to listen, and and to and to um, for me, it's an interject levity and fun into the process. Um, because the creative process 
uh, sometimes has a lot of personal feelings invested in it. And people can get very serious and very involved and very intense. Um, and to keep it kind of light sometimes is good, not in a way of like, let's make fun of you and your vision, but in a way that I don't know if you saw the Beatles uh, documentary. Did you see the way the Beatles worked? Man, they kept it fun and light. And they didn't ever took themselves too seriously. And yet they were making amazing music right there on the spot. Very interesting. And 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 I think a similar type of um, attitude and mood within the cutting room or on the phone is a really positive thing and helps create the creative process. Yeah, to me, I mean, if you're not having fun, I don't know what the point is. <laughs> you know, so like yeah. it's there's the, the there's there's plenty of just jobs in the world. If if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it because I'm enjoying it. So, um, but yeah, the, the my process. I mean, I spend um, uh, I I spend a lot of time looking at the, the script and just trying to determine what I think these scenes are about. And so I'll spend a lot of time looking at those. Um, uh, in narrative TV, we have a thing called a tone meeting where we go page by page, scene by scene with the director and the producer and the writer. And we talk about what is, you know, what are these, what are these scenes about? Because, you know, there's, I, I think sort of that's the greatest thing about like filmmaking and, and especially editorial, like somebody saying something as simple as just the word cool can mean a million different things, depending on, you know, how much space you put behind it, how much space you put in front of it, how fast they say it, you know, do they say it as they're walking away or whatever? Like it's, it, there's a, there's a lot of room and there's a lot of, space to uh learn and change what it is and as as pi said too there's you know i think my favorite people to collaborate with are people that are uh willing to look at it uh beyond what was just shot you know uh it's just like okay well what could this be you know what do i want it to be what do i want to feel it to be and and to kimberly's point yeah we make the movie three times uh the most interesting thing to me about that analogy is that we the as the editor you're the you're making it the last time. <laughs> this is it, it, it's it is it's the only thing that gets that we are working on that anybody else sees other than the few hundred people that are working on the project itself. So um, I, I, and I, you know, I like food a lot. So I always make it uh, the analogy to uh, to food, which is like a chef may write the recipe, the farmers may go and get you all of the ingredients, but the editors, the cook. And and they are making the actual dish that the other person eats. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. Yeah. I love that. I think we're in such a time where flashbacks and nonlinear storytelling really is such an entry point to making exciting, unexpected, breaking the boundaries of cliche and kind of hackneyed scenes we've seen over and over again. I mean, who can forget the first time they saw Memento. What? And um, and ed that came from the editorial, you know, for somebody, for Chris to be able to work on something like that, you have to be able to really break boundaries and think outside the box. How do you as an artist, when you do have such an important role in crafting these pieces, navigate either from an agency side or a client side or even you know lou working with somebody like john that's so specific and thoughtful and every word was crafted for a reason and so just changing things in the edit isn't going to flow the same way <laughs> working with the person who wrote a master this masterpiece talk about how you draw that line from you know how do you going to feel some kind of way about the way that you edited it and that you believe this is the right way to tell the story and navigating somebody not agreeing or not digging it or the network notes come back and as great as it is, you got to change it. And how do you stay encouraged and inspired in the light of all your hard work sometimes can be like a Thanos snap of, <laughs> yeah, that's great. But we're going to do, I need you to do something different. And how do you artistically stay uplifted when it can feel really challenging? This is probably, I would say for me coming up, this was probably the hardest lesson to learn. Um, but I think the probably the easiest way I could put it is that like, I mean, again, we're sort of in this lucky period of, <clears throat> you know, back in the day when you cut a piece of film, like 
you actually literally cut that piece of film. So that was, <laughs> you know, it was a real big deal to, to change that. Um, but nowadays people want me to try something different. I'm like, okay, duplicate the sequence. I still got that other one. That other one exists. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and then to me, I think it, it, to what you're saying, I think it's, it's really important to sort of be open-minded to everything. I, I certainly don't know how to make every film perfectly. Uh, I, you know, there's no way anybody would. So I think the idea and the openness of exploring and being able to be like, oh, well, this could be interesting. Let's see where that can go. Um, is something that I think you have to cultivate in yourself. And again, I have to say for myself, it was, it was probably one of the hardest things to learn because, uh, you know, I, I like certain things and I wanted it, things a certain way. Obviously when you're doing your editor's cut, you're doing it the way you want to do it, but that is not necessarily, you know, what it should be. And so I think the, the ability to sort of be open and, and sort of try everything. And um, to your point, um, Kimberly, with John, he's, um, uh, I work with John Ridley a lot. And so, um, you know, he's, he's a fantastic writer. And, but he is, he is probably the, one of the most people, the people that I'm most impressed by is like, as much as precisely sculpted as his scripts are, he'll come in and he'll be like, okay, what could this be? Like, let's take a look and try a bunch of different things. And, you know, um, what Pi was saying too, is like, we do nonlinear stuff like all the time, not scripted, it, you know, we'll just kind of get in the room and be like, huh, what would happen if we did this? And that sort of level collaboration is sort of the ultimate thing you want, but that's not always the case, you know? Um, and there's some people, yeah, you're gonna, you're not going to agree with, but I'm a big believer that you can learn something from everybody. So, um, you know, they may not, you may not want to do it that way, but take a look, who knows, you may really, really like it that way. So um, I think it's just that level of openness is, is super important to the, to that, to that process, to the whole process of filmmaking, I think on every level. Yeah, I agree with Lou, like you got to be open because you know, even as you get more experience and you kind of, I, I get to, I tend to know how things are going to happen throughout this process of this, of a series that I've done, similar series, I've done, you know, 25 of these things. And then we get some young, uh, inexperienced people come in and they, they, they think it's going to go one way. And I'm like, I know how it's going to go. All right. You're going to have me do this and it doesn't work because of this reason. And then I'm going to show it to the network. And then, you know, it's going to say, why didn't you have the guest star more prevalent throughout the entire episode? This is crazy. <laughs> Like, no, no, the guest stars are no good. They're not going to want to see that. And, uh, and, you know, and so we go through the whole thing and, um, and I follow their instructions. They're like, no, no, I was really going to be this way. And you do it. And then it gives them that word and they come back with a nose. And it's like, see, I knew it. I knew it. It was just like, <laughs> you should have done it the way I thought. And so I get this kind of like little ego inside me that's like, I know what's going to happen. I know. But so many times that ego has shown up where I'm like, you know, this other person is not as experienced as I am. Tell me what to do. And then I'll be like, eh. All right, I'll do it, but I know it's going to turn out better the way I'm thinking it would go. And then, <laughs> surprise, it actually turned out better the way they told me to do it. And so you have to be humble and you have to be open because you're not right all the time. It's like, what is it? Is it Dr. Phil who was like, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Do you want to be happy? <laughs> yeah, you, you just keep that ego in check, baby. Just relax and just be part of the creative yeah. process. It's an experimental process, especially as Lou was saying with these nonlinear editors, man. Just try different stuff, let it happen. Sometimes you're gonna have clients. Uh, I know I have one of the best people I work with, I, I work with through his process, which is he's so, de he's so decisive. No, 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 don't do it that way. Cut it back one frame. Okay, now take this filter, put in 96 in that parameter there, 220 there, and then it's gonna just zoom in 2%, not three, 2%. And the next day he'll look at it and go like, oh, no, that's wrong. I, you know, I, I don't know why you did it that way. You need to do it this way. And it's like, dude, the way I did it was exactly what you said. I, did, I, mean, I, just, I just button pushed. But I have learned not to get resistant because he's a very, decisive person and we get a great end product but he has to go process of making decisions looking at it the next day with an objective point of view and going like oh now let's try this other thing exactly like this and uh and it's like well that's 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 great that's just a process and if you're working and you're truly collaborating with someone uh, if you're truly a friend or coworker to someone you accept their foibles their idiosyncrasies or their flaws or whatever you want to label it as 
as, as the process that you're going to go through together. And um, I think as an editor, you want to facilitate that, right? You're getting this, the, the vision and, and however that may need to happen for whatever project you're on is the way it needs to happen. And you need to be open to, to that, to that collaborative process and how that means sacrificing your ego. Just, just don't worry about it, man. Just try things and, 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 and be surprised and make it fun and, um, and don't get attached to, 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 I feel like this is right. Yeah. This has got to be right. You, you can feel that that's fine. Use your instincts and make your point and make a little argument, but don't, don't plant a flag in the ground and die on a hill over edits, man. It's just, it just creates bad blood and, and there's no, no reason to do it. That's yeah. so great. I love the way that you shared that. I think we can all relate to that. So let's talk about, uh, we've had a couple of people mention, um, we need to define for our audience um, non-narrative, non-scripted documentary. We've been throwing a lot of terms around, so it'd be really helpful for some of our audience to understand the difference between non-narrative and unscripted storytelling. And we use some phraseology on the non-narrative side. So for each of you, what is, how do you define it? What are the, <laughs> and, and while we're in that conversation, I think it's important. I know a lot of people coming on the come up are really focused on their narrative storytelling career and they might be reluctant to start working as an apprentice or an AE in the unscripted non-scripted side um, because there's they don't know that they'll be able to get back to narrative if they some you know there was a day where there were so many reality shows that there were so many post opportunities but people were reluctant feeling that if they started to build their experience in that space, it'd be more difficult to then get onto an hour drama or a half hour comedy. So in the conversation of which is what, what narrative and what's <laughs> not in the non-narrative, can you also talk a little bit about your thoughts in that? In that well, area? It's, it's really funny. I, um, Pai and I, uh, we were on the uh, Television Academy um, executive group. And, and I think one of the things that we always ran into was like, you know, there's different categories for um, uh, for certain things like uh, competition, reality, or whatever. And I, I, I feel like Pi and I, we've had these conversations a million times over and over. And ultimately, everything's a little soft in in, in those definitions. Um, so I would say, as much as we define them, they are that they're all very soft uh, in terms of those lines. So, for example, I mean, I'm working on a narrative, what was considered narrative, which is uh, somebody wrote a script. And somebody shot it, and we're putting it together. Okay. Um, um, yeah, but the but the weird thing is this: there is a lot of um, documentary elements in it, and so I'm cutting tiny little like two or three minute documentaries in the middle of something. So um, I always kind of think about it like um, the Big Short, where like some of it is some of it's real, some of it's not, you know, and they kind of go back and forth. And I think that's gonna that's generally becoming more and more common but yeah i would say well just it, that's what can yeah. be a little confusing to start with yep. so for people who are just tuning into this for the first yeah. time they yeah. don't really know anything about anything let's right. define narrative storytelling versus documentary storytelling and the right. different the different sections of documentary which include reality television non-scripted um yeah. things that are maybe more docu docu-series that right. isn't considered reality or competition if we yeah. could just explain let's do narrative as narrative yeah and leave so, that written stuff out of it for right now let's just yeah. set the basics right so i i'd, I'd probably say the, the biggest line as you just put which is narrative which is something that is been written by somebody and then shot as planned and that's considered narrative and that can include an hour drama a feature film that concludes, um, oh, sorry, things are getting a little stuck. Did we lose? Oh, I think Lou, yeah, Lou's internet might have cut out or something. Okay. To, Hi, you yeah. want to jump in? Well, just to pick up what Lou was saying, it's like, so narrative equals fiction, right? Script, uh, actors, and then, you know, Netflix uh, series or, or movie. Uh, Star Wars fiction. Yeah, the making of Star Wars documentary. 
Exactly. Behind the scenes. Oh, this is George Lucas. And George, what did you think about, you know, where did you come up with this idea, George? Well, I, you know, read Joseph Campbell and I wanted to make a sci-fi film, blah, blah, blah. That's a documentary behind the scenes. I think he's back. He, he, did we get he's you back. back was he still frozen? He, 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 he was here. Oh, I'm he, here. I hear okay. you. There, now we see I've, him. I've heard everything you guys <laughs> Okay, good. So we're, you're coming in and out for us, Lou. So I'm going to have Pi keep going. Right. So, I mean, you know, w so within the nonfiction genre uh, or side of things, you've got these other subgenres, which is, you know, there's like basic documentary where the, you know, camera people and the sound recorders, you just try and stay out of what's happening um, and let just, you know, what whatever is transpiring occur. Um and then there's sort of reality where the producers of the event or, you know, like the housewives of Beverly Hills, um, you know, they they have a hand in in crafting what is going on. It's manipulative and it's called reality when it's just, you know, people are making stuff up. And, you know, Which maybe going to include Kardashians. That's going to include your. Um... What else is considered reality that's kind of character based? Any of the shows of, um, sorry, what did the like real, Ink real Masters? Yeah. Right. Um, I did one in Spanish called uh, uh, Familia de Circo. Um, yeah. Where, you know, we would come up with storylines and have them enact it. Now, that's different than a competition show, right? That's right. And there's like laws governing like how you cannot influence events. Um, you know, with American Idol, for example, or America's Got Talent. The voice. Mm -hmm. These are people, yeah, these are people who are competing uh, for big money. And so you just shoot what you see, you know. Um, but however, what's where the gray area or soft line, as Lou's mentioned, it occurs in, in documentary and in, in reality competition shows where you're not really creating storylines at all, you're just following the action, is in an interview, right? So in an interview, you can say like, so what, why are you here? Why are you competing? And they'll be like, well, when I was five years old and they will then like launch into 45 minutes of why. And you're like, dude, our show is 45 minutes. I want a 10 second soundbite at the most. And so you can help guide them into saying like, my grandmother was my biggest influence and I'm doing it for her. You know, creating and crafting sound bites out of their authentic reality is the gray area and so you can help shorten that's basically what you do is shorten and pick sound bites um uh with them um you know and and then the, the sort of grayer zone is like <laughs> you know sort of guiding them to a quote that would sound really good you know and so producers you know they can get in the trouble there or i like or the word prompt words. prompt yeah there you go talk to yeah I embrace the word prompt and we, uh, you know, I make a lot of documentary. Um, we have a new one that just premiered on HBO max last week called uprooted. So go check it out. And in uprooted, when we were doing, we have the overall thesis that we think is the overall sentence of our film. But when we're talking to the different, uh, people we were interviewing, we have certain questions structured a certain way that hopefully will get them with the sound bite that we're looking for on the subject matter. I don't want, I don't want to influence the outcome of the answer. I just want them to answer. I want a sound bite on a certain topic. And so I structure the question to try to get them to speak to yeah. their belief system about extraterrestrials or whatever it is. So yeah. Sometimes I've, I've directed and produced docs too. And so sometimes you ask them the question, like what, you know, after they give the 10 minute answer, you're like, would it be fair to say, that you feel, and then you give them the like, yes, you know, the sky is blue. This disease needs to be treated with more money from the federal government. Right. And they're like, yeah, I would. Can you say that for me? Say that in a whole sentence. Can no, you repeat no, no, no. the question back to me yeah. Yeah. in a sentence? And so those are techniques of storytelling. Um, and Lou, I'd love re in speaking about this. Um, you've worked in animation a little bit as well. And so if you could sprinkle in for those who might be thinking about coming in from a game AR VR and animation side, if you could incorporate your experience 
as you're discussing non-scripted versus working in narrative? Yeah, um, yeah, the animation part of it is very, it's it's fascinating actually, I, I, I kind of love it. It's um, the early on in the process where you are given is basically a bunch of drawings and you basically just still drawings, not not nothing animated. And you you get a voice track and you basically are making the movie out of stills and voices. And then from there, um, you know, you'll work with a director or um, or the producer. And sometimes in these animation fields, they'll have literally an artist sitting behind you that has a pad and they'll uh, a digital pad and they'll draw something and they'll just send it to your avid and then you have a new picture. So it's like, you know, the equivalent of being on set and being like, oh, I'd love a close up here. And they just draw you a close up. Um, uh, so that process is is, uh, is very interesting. It's, it's very collaborative. It's it's extremely long. I mean, I've, uh, I've, I've known friends who have worked two whole years on a movie in animation and they never, they, they didn't finish it in those two years. Somebody else finished it two years later. <laughs> so uh, you could, yeah. you, it's, it's a, it's, it's a long, it's a long process, but it's, it's really fascinating. If you're really into that, it's a great, it's a, it, there's, you know, there's a lot of work and, and it stays very long. So if you like working on something for a very long time, you could, you can be on one movie for uh, three or four years uh, sometimes. So Especially um, if you're working on a big event, if you get into the Marvel universe, if you get into um, shows that have a lot of IP, yeah, you can have five, 10 years of work on yeah. one IP. And because once you know the language of the land yeah. uh, and you know the where the, you've signed the DNR, the do not disclose or whatever that is, yeah. uh, they'll keep you in that world forever. Yeah, I had, I had a friend who started on uh, Lord of the Rings uh, and he moved to New Zealand and 20 years later, he's still there. <laughs> My friends that have worked at Weta, and it's the only place they ever worked. Yeah. Um, NDA, that's what I was searching for. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your own philosophy in terms of um, reality television or non-scripted uh, coming in as an editor and then moving over to, to, oh, to, to narrative and... Oh, uh, for me, yeah, it was... Um... Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I started, I started in reality because at least at the time when I started, uh, those were the jobs. There were, there were hundreds and hundreds of jobs. There was never enough people, uh, at least when I was starting to work. Um, and so I, um, uh, like I said, a friend of mine called me up and, and basically told me to come, come do this job and I needed to pay rent. And so I just did it. Um, and it was, you know, um, it, it was it's, it was a difficult thing, but uh, like I said before, it was a great place to learn because there was just so much stuff going on. And there's so much footage to kind of to handle. Um, but yeah, moving from narrative was for me very simple, and I was very lucky, which is that I basically just had a friend who was on Grey's Anatomy, their first season, and literally she was like, um, "Here's here's what you need to do to get in the union," because most most uh, scripted narrative projects are union. She's like, "Here are the steps that you need to do to get in the union." And she's like, go do that. I'm going to call you in two weeks and make sure you did it. And sure enough, she called me two weeks later and she's like, did you, did you turn in all your paperwork? And I did. Um, and from there, she got me an interview um, on a narrative show. But uh, that's, I mean, that's just about as lucky and easy as it gets. But um, for most people, it's some sort of combination of like, you know, somebody here and they happen to need somebody at this moment and you're available. And um, that's, that's that move is probably one of the hardest ones, but I don't know. I, I, much like other things that, and I think Pi could probably speak to this too, is like everything's a little bit kind of mixed nowadays, and it's uh, it's it's less of a sort of like a defined uh, line, and it's it's been um, it, it, even even working in TV narrative, moving to feature narratives was also a huge leap back in the day, but now it's all a little bit softer. I have I have friends who were reality editors who got to move to narratives and now they're, you know, now they're doing narrative features and, you know, yeah. it was just sort of uh, the flow of it all, especially with Netflix and all these other streaming services, it's really kind of changed the landscape pretty drastically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's, there's more uh, glory in narrative filmmaking because uh, there's movie stars, right? And <laughs> so folks, 
want like that's kind of you know the oscars are the the big award ceremony and you don't really see reality tv shows at the oscars it's all the big stars and the narrative films and the the scripts and everything so people generally want to move into narrative where there's a lot of glory and you know maybe your filmmaking dreams come true as a storyteller um so a lot of folks do want to move over and so that can be it can be tough because it's more competitive i think in general in narrative uh because more people want to be there and i think it's also um you know when you're an executive producer or a director you want to hire somebody who has a lot of experience in the in the realm that you're working because it's very difficult and so if someone's like hey yeah i've worked you know on uh, you know mtv's road rules or whatever I, you know it's, it's you're like but my thing's a real polished kind of movie star piece like you don't necessarily have the skills so yeah it can be it can be tough to move over and, and i think it's all about finding opportunity um but as as you know as, if you're someone who wants to do that you need to uh maybe do some lower budget narrative stuff um to have on your reel um, or you volunteer as an editor if you're really desperate um, to move over and do some some short films, um, some narrative work, so that you have experience and value and and can show somebody, hey, I'm ready to make the move to this other type of storytelling. Um, I would say that's true for almost everything, right? Like you, yeah. if you want to get into any given field or part, you got to sort of do some of the 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 free work or whatever you want to call it, just sort of do stuff on the side and or smaller projects to kind of prove yourself because, you know, I, I don't think there's any reality where they're just like, oh, you off the street, come here and edit this uh, Marvel movie or something like that. I think, uh, you know, there's there's small steps to everything, what, which, whatever process that is, right, to uh, uh, whether that's documentary work or, 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 or uh, you know, competition reality or narratives, anything, anything and everything in between. It's it's those little bit of uh, small steps and trying to get your foot in the doors is probably the very, very first step. Yeah, that's really um, super helpful. A really great way to think about it. I hope everybody takes that as an encouragement that there isn't um, a barrier to entry. You just have to really get in there and try a lot of different things to figure out a what you're strong at and what you love. and. Yeah. Both of those things need to coexist to have a happy career and a thriving career in this business. Um, yeah, so and, gonna... and, and in doing that, I, I think there's sort of two two aspects that you need to think about as you're working through your career. Is one is the material. Does it, if what you're working with like saps your soul dry and leaves you an empty husk at the end of the day, maybe you need to move to a different genre. Um, yeah. Or if the people you're working with. Bingo are sapping your soul dry and leaving you an empty husk. You need to find a different group of people. For me, um, I can work on shows with good people um, that has content that I'm less interested in because of the people. Um, or I can work on shows that like feed my soul. It's like an amazing project, even though this person's an egomaniac and kind of a nightmare to be around. The the end result is so like satisfying as an artist to have been involved with that I'll put up with stuff. And so it's really about this balance for me between personnel and material. I think it's critical. We spend so much of our lives together. Sometimes I'll spend more time with my film team than I'm spending with my own family. Mm -hmm. And so as I have grown in this business and been here for a minute, I find I value more the quality of time I'm spending with my collaborators and that I will pass on things that on paper would be my Oscar shot or my Emmy shot because I know to be in a room with that person for a year would be difficult. Would just be difficult for me spiritually and mm -hmm. those kind of things I find are of more increasing value the longer I'm, I'm in the game. Yeah, and you know, to that point, I, I I remember probably one of the best pieces of advice I got from a professor in film school who's a producer was, uh, if you want to do this, if you want to be in this business, just be prepared for a m emotional and financial roller coaster. Yeah, uh, because <laughs> that's just sort of the nature of it. I mean, you're not going to always get to do, uh, you know, the projects you want to do or work with the people you want to work with, but 
you know, there's ebbs and flows to that. And I think, uh, I, I think coming into it with the understanding and the reality of that, at least for me was, was huge to know that like, yeah, this can be just disappointing for a while. That's just, that's just the nature of it. But uh, I, I don't think that's, I think that's true of every job though. I think that's, that's something you, you got to kind of agree to, but I, I think the yeah. ebbs and flows are much bigger in our industry. I mean, there are, there are years where I, I can't find work and then there's years that I can't, the phone won't stop ringing. So like, <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's all part of the process though. For me, I found, um that i found a group of people that i enjoyed working with and i said you know, this years ago i was like you know i don't I, i'd worked with independent filmmakers which is you know as kimberly knows like it's a mixed bag man you can get real maniacs you just don't want to be around ever again and then you get really creative people but they don't work that often so you can't it's hard to collaborate with them on a long term career yeah so I was like, I found this group of like TV producers and editors that I was like, I, I love their work ethic. Like when something goes wrong, they don't like find the guilty and blame them and persecute. They're just like, okay, something went wrong. Let's figure out what it is and we'll work it out together. And I'm like, well, who did? it doesn't really matter. Like, let's just figure it out. Like let's work together. And I was like, wow, just that attitude, just that collaborative attitude and not blaming people and seeking out and persecuting was so huge and such a cultural shift from some of the places I'd been with independent filmmakers that I was like, I'm going to just, I don't I, I I don't know where these people are going. I'm just gonna stick with this group of people and see where it goes, you know? And um and there's been ebbs and flows. But the nice thing about the ebbs and flows is that we kind of done it as a group. And so there's for me, I've been able to work a lot because um this group will go into different other shows and the, and uh, they'll be able to pick me up and, and bring me along with them for yeah. the ride as an editor. And every time I work on a show. Now I know a lot of people and we have fun um, while we're doing our shows. Um, it's been a little less fun during the pandemic because we're not physically together. While working at home. We're all two dimensional <laughs> like projections on a screen that we see, you know, once a week we do a Zoom meeting, which is uh, disappointing um, when your goal has been to focus on relationships over content. But, but on the other hand, goodness, my friends is who had jobs in post have worked more than anybody else through the pandemic because they could work at home and many people were already set up with some sort of bay at home that, you know, because so the other half of that is a lot of post people got to work through post um, yeah. because of the dynamic of how how you work. And so that was the the, the blessing that came with the yeah. lack of camaraderie you guys have had. The yeah. pandemic was very nice to wait 15 years until 2020 to hit us when we had the technology to, to have edit base at home. Can you imagine? Yeah. Oh my God. So yeah. As we start to kind of wrap this up, I um we had a real quick question about as we in, get inspired by the people that we watch and we learn from and we collaborate with, where is the line from homage and inspiration to I'm just copying how that person did it? And what are the, the artistic parameters? I mean, it's kind of a tough question in post because some shows want a procedural is a procedural. It's not copying, it's structure. It's the structure of the show. So do you want to, do you guys any have any opinions on that? Well, like, I mean, plagiarism in the editing process? I don't know that that, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> you know that's with thing. that. I don't think that's a thing. Yeah. I mean, you could do someone's style, but like your content's new, so uh, you wouldn't be caught. But like, you know, writing, yeah, you, you know, you want to. I mean, I think if somebody tried to cut the way that Chris cut like Inception or some old Hitchcock or I don't know. But again, that's well, structural. So if you're a, so Lou usually hands a whole episode or a movie for himself. Um, I'm on right. a team of 12 or 14. So it's important that we do the same style. So we want to be copying each other. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to learn the skill of, of, of mimicry um, and you need to, you know, watch, Hey, the network really loves act four from episode 102. So like everyone look to that for like stylistic inspiration, right? You want to, you want to, figure out how other people have done it and then do the same. And, and, and it's, um, so that's a, that's an important skill 
because some editors come on our shows and they're like, we're like, hey, look at, you know, act two of episode or act four of episode 102 and, you know, mimic that as style. And then they'll just have some other different style. And it's just like, what are you doing? Like that, that editor, like may not work with us anymore. Um, so I would imagine though, that, uh, you know, if you're with a, a filmmaker of repute who wants to try something new and what you're doing seems rote and um, not fresh, then that could also work against you. Um, and you wanna be able to just be conscious of what you're in and cognizant of what you're doing and the stylistic choices you're making. Are you just, you know, is Guy Ritchie's, you know, style something that works for the project you're on? Um, are you, are you, you know, just copying what he's up to or do you have something new to add? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a fairly uh, deep and difficult question to answer, frankly. It's a, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say at least early on in, um, your career, it's, it's good to actually straight up copy somebody because you're, <laughs> you're going to learn some stuff uh, just by copying. I mean, that's what that's what great artists did. They literally would go to a museum and sit in front of a painting and, and paint that exact painting again just to kind of get an idea for but it. So, yeah, so it's a it's 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 a good skill. Um, I think um, I I think what Pi is saying is you know happens to me too a lot, which is that like sometimes I'm like okay, well I'm on a show for. Um, I don't know, ABC. And so they sort of have a certain style. They want, you know, whatever, a lot of music or, you know, CW, they have a very specific style for what they want or HBO, they want a certain thing. And so I think, and again, this goes back to the analysis thing to be able to like, look at something and be like, okay, this is the way they want it tonally, uh, editorially. And to be able to be like, okay, I can replicate that. Or like, this is, these are the elements that make it that show. And so we'll, we'll, we'll try those. And I think that's uh, that's an important skill to have. Uh, it's fairly advanced, but I think it's an important skill to have. But copying other stuff is probably a good place to start, frankly. I mean, it's it, it'll help you learn a lot. So. so that's super helpful. Thank you. I'd like to wrap up with our last um, topic we're going to talk about for about five minutes is where do you post job opportunities? Where do you find entry level does the company that you work with or the post houses that you use have internships apprenticeships entry level so for those that have ready to take their first steps um and then when's the right time for them to go to editors guild and start to learn about what they're going to need to do over the next five to ten years to get eligible to get into the union but if you could start with where does somebody where do you go to post job opportunities what sites are you using word of mouth who are you reaching out to are you look going to the facebook groups are there groups on instagram or linkedin where you're sourcing new talent before we go right there i just wanted to add just a couple of resources um, that I wanted to recommend to people. Um, right. There's a there's a book called Make the Cut, a guide to becoming a successful assistant editor that uh, folks may want to check out. Uh, I think it's by Lori Coleman and author? Diana Friedberg. Lori Coleman and Diana Friedberg. Okay. Um, and we had mentioned um, editstock.com. I think editmentor.com is is associated with them, and um, I think it's more personal uh, uh, mentorship. Um, and there's also, if you want to like go pro, um, and like go, try and get into like higher end, uh, assistant editing, um, master the workflow.com. I've heard great things about, and I've had friends who've gone to learn how to become an assistant editor, um, for like narrative features and, um, narrative, uh, series, I think as well. Awesome. So those are some resources to check out. Um, and. Uh, like I'd mentioned before, you, you know, Facebook's a great place um, to find like Blue Collar Post Collective is um, a great place to find entry level um, positions. I think in general, the concept is this. You want to find people who can recommend you for jobs and you want to find opportunities. If that means post houses so post production facilities where you could find internships, you could find entry level receptionist um, 
production assistant, like stocking the fridge, making the coffee. Like those are great places to start. That's entry level. You can get in there. Just look up around you or in interesting places, um, post-production facilities, look on the internet, find a way to make it make sense for you. Like if you just find, if you just get a list of like 25 post houses and you're just sending them um, resumes, like, hey, looking for a job, resume. Hey, looking for a job, resume. It's it's probably not gonna be very fruitful. So I don't know in your life what you have or where you live or who you know or what interests you that would make sense for a particular post house to make more sense to you. Like maybe it's close to your home and you can go and you can visit and you can show up and you can chat. Like there needs to be some other kind of entryway that makes you stand out as a person that they wanna be around. I used to go to this post house, they would hire me from time to time. And then at lunch, we would sit and we, you know, people would talk and there was the question would always be, hey, what are you working on? And I was, oh, I'm working on this show for ABC or whatever. And then I would go on days when I didn't have a job, I would go and I would eat lunch there anyway. And they'd be like, hey, Pi, what are you up to? And I'm like, oh, just, you know, eating lunch. And they're like, what, jo what show are you on? I'm like, I'm actually not on a show right now. I just came to eat lunch here. <laughs> and, and they're like, really? Why? And I'm like, because... <laughs> And because maybe someone, and then someone would come by, like, hey, Pi, are you on a show? I'm like, no. Hey, or what are you doing tomorrow? Are you free? Yes. Okay. Well, we need you for this other show. And I was like, see, I'm here to be in people's heads. I'm here <laughs> to remind you this, have, remember this person? <laughs> he needs a job. <laughs> um, that's one way. And you need to figure out your own way to make things make sense for you and, and to show up in a way that people will remember you and think about you when you're not around. Yeah, I think I think the the process is um, is very varied. I mean, for me personally, I almost entirely uh, look for people to hire through people I know. So it's like somebody you know, somebody somebody, or I'll I'll um, uh, lately I've been doing stuff where I'll check in with uh, the diversity uh, group over at ACE, and then you know they'll have people that they've been trying to uh, get into certain places, and so. Um, uh, at, at least in, in my circle and at my level, I, uh, we don't post jobs. Like they almost all come through connections. Um, I mean, I used to make the joke that, uh, the res my, uh, you know, a resume is only a place to put your email address and your phone number. Like it, it, it almost doesn't matter <laughs> that the rest of it. And so, um, at least that's for me, how I've done it. But if, if I was to give advice to somebody, I think that there's a lot of, I, I think all those resources Pi mentioned are fantastic. Um, there's also, uh, Ava DuVernay started a group called Array Crew, uh, which is for, uh, underrepresented individuals. I think that's, that's, uh, I haven't been on it myself, but I imagine that's, that's a very good resource. And all you need is one credit. Yeah. And so, um, uh, stuff like that, there's other, like more difficult, but prestigious stuff. Like there's the ACE internship, which is super fantastic. I've, I've seen people. What's it uh, called? Uh, it's the internship for the American cinema editors, uh, ACE. Um, and so they have an internship program. It's, it's fairly competitive, but, um, you know, I've known people who have gone through there and now they're, they're huge, uh, feature editors. Um, so that's, uh, that's a good place to, to, uh, look, but that, you know, with the understanding that that's very competitive, I think there's a few other, um, internships like that. I know Pixar has a specific, if you want to do animation, Pixar has a very specific internship path for, um, editing and, you know, you, you apply. I think they bring you up there and then you're working in Edinburgh for years. And so, um, that's also a, a very direct path. Um, but yeah, those are, but I would say a lot of the resources Pi mentioned are probably your, your most yeah. accessible. I'm going to add a couple. So yeah. we're going to encourage you as you start to uh, check out, make sure you're listed on productionhub.com. You can start to put your credits up as you're starting out, especially for PA. As soon as you get your first PA gig, you can start listing yourself on staffmeup.com, which is really critical. A lot of television is staffed out of there and it's national. So no matter where you are, people are shooting everywhere. I also encourage you to, as you're starting out, to check out the film schools in your area. At every film school from Pasadena City College to Santa Monica, there are people working on their short films in their video classes. They all need post support. Every show always needs help. And so finding, um, sometimes I'll look in the casting notices to see what shows are gearing up. 
and they normally have a contact information and you can offer your um, entry level post services. You're looking for post PA gigs. Who's your editor? Can I volunteer for them? Um, many times think about film festivals or think about events, whether it's X Games. We live in, if, especially when we're in Southern California, there's tons of events. They normally have media teams that are um, filming the events, the behind the scenes. They normally have editors and assistant editors that they need to cover their events. And so it's a really unique way of, of finding an opportunity and listing yourself. So there's some thoughts to add in. Yeah. And, so, and, and overall, I, I think, you know, as we've said over and over again, it's just like, get to know people. And, yeah. and you know, those people maybe, you know, they'll maybe point you to new resources, or they'll know somebody that knows somebody who knows somebody. <laughs> I mean, of, yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've, will go to, houses. you know, film festivals or special screenings, like American Cinematheque has a lot of like, yeah, um, art films or historical films, classic cinema screenings, you know, public screenings is a great place to meet people who are interested in filmmaking. Um, I mean, you know, all these great filmmakers, they go to these screenings, they check out past yeah. works and you want to find a community where that has common interests so that it all kind of works for you. Um, and that's a great way to not only educate yourself about cinema or, or about, you know, classic television, um, but you can meet people that can help maybe get you opportunities in the future. Absolutely. And in that, as Pai is saying, you want to look at women in media, which is women and media.com. They have a great crew support program, always helping people source opportunities. Um, and, and think about starting to attend film independent. They have a lot of events that you can ticket, um, per event. And a lot of their events are still happening virtually. So you don't have to be in LA. Um, and there are a lot of things you can access before having to get into the membership levels. Um, that might be cost prohibitive for some of you, but at least start to attend the virtual events, start to learn who's who, as Pai was saying, and um, take your shot. Yeah, and it, the Film Independent also has, a uh, again, a, a group that I was involved with called Project Involved, which also is a, a great resource for people just trying to make their way into the industry. Awesome. I hope you can hear the virtual applause from our really grateful audience. For you guys to get up on a Saturday and spend this time with us has been really, really special. And having your just telling us like it is, it, we really appreciate the straight talk. Um, for all of you audience members, we're so grateful for you spending the time. This will be available on YouTube. Caroline, I'll tell you more details about that. Please make sure to send Caroline in the library uh, any questions, resources that the library has with equipment, how to get free editorial downloads. Um, Caroline's gonna jump in and tell you more about it. Thank you, Lou, thank you, Pi. So grateful for all this great information you shared. Caroline. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, uh, Caroline, actually, I had a question. Uh, back in a few years ago, they were uh, part of LA County Library. You had access to both um, Canopy, which is a, a streaming website, as well as uh, uh, lynda.com was also free, I think, through LA County. Yes, thank, thank yeah. you for that. It's such a good okay. segue. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So thank with you. your library card, you can access Canopy to watch uh, thousands of movies um, streaming. Um, and then with uh, lynda.com, it's now called LinkedIn Learning. Okay. Uh, and so I put the uh, link in the chat, um, but I will give everybody a resource document too. But yeah, you can access thousands of videos and I know they have Avid, I know they have Premiere. Um, I don't know if they have, uh, what's the other one? Resolve. Resolve but I'll, they probably do. Um, uh, but yeah, you can learn. And they also have storytelling, like just basics of film. So, and also with the library too, if you don't have access to a computer or internet regularly, you can also check out um, a Chromebook hotspot kit from our libraries as well to take home, just like you would check out any book for three weeks. Um, and you just return it or can renew it um, if there aren't any holds. So yes, there are like a million thank yous in the chat and this was an amazing um, discussion. So thank you to the three of you. Thank you, uh, Lou and Pai. Um, it was so much information and um, I, and I think we could have touched, uh, we touched on so many things and I think there's a lot more we probably could have done. So hopefully we can do this again someday. Um, so uh, I'm so grateful for your time. Um, if you uh, participants, 
in the audience would like to explore more about the topics we discussed today, uh, don't worry about furiously writing down all the resources I put in the chat. Uh, we will give you a document that has them all. I'll email it to you, so keep an eye out for it, along with a recording of this presentation. A uh, special shout out to Chris in the chat, too, who sent a lot of ton of really cool like resources, too. So, um, Like I mentioned, this is a part of a series that is going on through May this year. Our next event is February 26th, Exploring Music Composition and Engineering. Uh, you can visit our website at, uh, I'm putting it in the chat, lacountylibrary.org slash creative dash careers to see the entire lineup of what we have through May. And the website also has recordings and resources for the events in the series we did last year as well, so you can review. Um, and if you're interested in participating in more of our upcoming virtual programs, please visit us at lacountylibrary.org. Have an amazing weekend, everybody.